but he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being weary from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, that's noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, and ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your many blessings. And God, we just thank you so much for Cowboy Church. And God, how we thank you for what you're doing in and through it. And Lord, as, uh, as these uh, folks face uh, um, and, and look forward to a, a rodeo season, and I pray, God, you just be with them, bless them. And God, bless the people that they touch and bless the people that are, are blessed by these programs and ministries. God, I pray that you would bless our times on Monday night, bless our time of studying the Gospel of John. God, as we go to this very dear text, we pray, God, that you would write upon our hearts these four phrases that come from the Word. We thank you for what you're going to do for us. We, pray, we thank you and bless you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys can be seated. You guys can be seated. Well, uh, the first phrase that, that I want us to look at in the story you know the story. Jesus, uh, he came to the well, and uh, this lady was here. She was there at noon. It wasn't the right time for her to be there. Uh, you're going to find out later in the story that she's uh, she's a, a loose woman, uh, for lack of a better word. We were talking about fast and skank a while ago. She fits the bill, right? And uh, so here we are, this lady. Uh, you know, she's here at noon time. She's there to draw water. The ladies of the town won't have nothing to do with her. Uh, she's got a lot on the men of the town for obvious reasons. And so Jesus comes and he says, uh, uh, give me a drink. And a very simple request, but she tells him, she's like, you're asking me? Uh, really, it should be Judea. You're, uh, you're, you're from Judea. You might ask the question how she knew that. They probably had a different accent uh, in Judea than they would have in Samaria. Probably had a different accent. You know... Uh, we go off places and people say, hey, say something, talk. You know, they like our southern accent, don't they? Uh, well, mine's pretty strong, so yeah, I get asked that even here. And they say that again, you know, or when I say, this is Brother Steve, they bust out laughing. And they're like, yeah, we didn't know who you were with that voice and that draw. Uh, but anyway, so she understood, she heard his, uh, and she heard, she knew that somehow he was Judean and and so she said, you know, you guys don't have anything to do with, with us. Uh, why, you know, why would you ask for me for a drink of water? And Jesus said, if you knew what I had, if you knew who I was and knew what kind of gift I had, you'd ask of me. And, and you could never thirst again. And so she went on thinking he's talking about something physical, that maybe he had a magic canteen or something. And she said, tell me more, tell me more. And so he begins to talk to her and and uh, after a little bit, it becomes clear to her that she know, he knows all about her. You know, even though they've never met, he knows everything there is to know. He says, she said, well, I'm not married. He said, well, kind of. You've been married several times, and the man that you're with now, uh, you're right. You know, uh, he's not your husband. And so she said, I perceive that you're a prophet. And so they talk some more, and uh, then they get into religious conversation, and you know, it basically, should we worship at the First Baptist Church of Samaria or the First Baptist Church of Jerusalem? You know, it's just a silly question. And he said, well, there's coming a time when God will be seeking and is seeking people who worship Him in truth and in spirit. And so they go on with their conversation, and after a little while, he, he lets her know that He is the Messiah. And she says, because she says, well, when the Messiah comes, He'll explain everything to us. And she, I think she was fishing a little bit. I think mean, she's already kind of catching on. I really do. And she had, you know, she said that to hear his response. And he said, well, I'm, I'm him. I'm, I'm the guy. I'm the one you're looking for. <coughs> and so she gets saved. She goes back. She leaves her water pot. She's so excited. She leaves her water pot. I, I just think that is so cool, don't you? I mean, you know, she is so excited. So people who leave their Bible on the hood and you know, and go to check out the window and all that kind of stuff. You know, we have great precedents here. 
she forgot her water bottle. She had, yeah, she had other things on her mind. She just got saved. She was excited. She went back to tell the town. And it's so cool that she witnesses to them. You know, she didn't go down there and say, I found the Messiah, y'all get up there. What she said was, this is a man that told me everything I have ever done. She said, think he might be the Messiah? You know, she didn't have to come on too hard. And so they said, well, we'll go listen to him. And after a while, they all get saved. It says all of them believe. And when they believe, they want her to know this. They say, well, we believe because we heard him, not because we listened to you. So all of that, there's a lot of game playing going on there and, and a lot of junky stuff going on. And when you come to these four different <coughs> phrases, they really teach us something very important. The first one is in verse 4. And it says, he needed to go through Samaria. He needed to go through Samaria. Now, there was some racial prejudice. And when I say racial, they, they were really kind of the same race, but it was a different region. And so there was, some, there was some hatred that was going on there, some racism that was going on there. And uh, so the Jews, when, uh, or those from Judea would be the better way to word it, when they would go uh, to, uh, to Galilee, uh, which would be like us going to Arkansas, okay? So just get, to, get the map in your head. So Jerusalem is south, straight south of Galilee. And all the way was the city of Sychar, the Tsar of Samaria. I mean, it was just straight through there. But Jewish people didn't take that route. They went around the city. And they went around the city because they didn't like the Samaritans. And there was a lot of history between them, a lot of bad history. And, you know, and, and they were the kind of people that say the only good Samaritans are what? Yeah. Dead Samaritans. This is the kind of hatred that they had. Remember the, the guy that got mugged? You know, and the, and the priest and the Levite walked by him, but the, it was the Samaritan. Who stopped? That was a major thing, and everybody took notice of that when Jesus told that story. Because what would have been noticeable to them was, you know, we call it the parable of the Good Samaritan. To them, there wasn't a Good Samaritan. There was that kind of racial prejudice between these people. And so when Jesus said, I got to go through Samaria, I mean, he's going through a place nobody else went through. You know, he, he's going, he's, he's reaching, listen to this, he's reaching the unreachable. He's loving what they think are the unlovable. He's touching the untouchable. He makes it a point to go to the place where nobody else wants to go. He makes it a point to reach out to the people nobody else wants to reach. And so it's just a beautiful, beautiful thing that Jesus does. I think about it like this. You know, if somebody would say, well, I, you know, I'm going I'm to go through Mississippi to get to Arkansas. Well, you look at them like, well, that ain't the way you go. That ain't the way to go, you know. Or, or better, maybe better yet, uh, maybe you could say, you know, if you were uh, out at the Ville, maybe if you were in, in Holloway and you wanted to go to Fishville or go up to Poly, you know, you could cut through where? Cotton Island, right? Yeah. And go through up through Bob Baptist Church and all through that area. But there's a lot of the year when you can't do that, right? There's some of the year when the water's too high, the water comes up there and you can't go there. Well, if the water was up and somebody said, I'm going to... I'm going up to Fishville through, you know, through Cotton Island. You say, well, you better not unless you can swim. You know, better have a boat. He's exactly right. So it was a direct path, but it was a path they never took. And so he needed to go through Samaria. Why? Why did he need to go through Samaria? He went through Samaria because there was all of these barriers. There was a racial barrier. He was Jewish. She was Samaritan. There was a gender barrier, which was a much... It's a kind of a thing now, but it was a huge thing then. Uh, a respectable man would not be talking to this kind of woman, uh, at, especially at noontime. time. Religious barrier. Uh, once again, even though it sounds like the same thing, it's not. They had, they had their Jewish faith that they were nurturing in Samaria. They had what they thought was a pure Jewish faith in Jerusalem. And there was another barrier. There was a morality barrier. He's a rabbi. He's a man of the cloth. He's a preacher. You know, and what we know is he's a lot more than that, right? I mean, he's the son of God. There's this huge morality barrier between her and him because here she is, uh, the town harlot of the lady who of ill repute. So Jesus tore down all these barriers. We've got to wrap our minds around that. We have got to, we got to get a hold of that. If there was a barrier between him and somebody, he's the one that tore the barrier down. And when you think about barriers between God and man, no barrier was bigger than heaven and earth. I mean, when he left the splendor of heaven, he, you know, he jumped over the biggest hurdle of all. God became man. That's exactly what happened in Jesus. God came in the form of a man, put on flesh, you know, wrapped in flesh, and here he was. 
He overcame all the barriers. I would think of it like this. Sometimes through the years I've I've heard that that innuendo in the background, that, that, that thought in it. Sometimes it was about race, other times it was about economic status or uh, you know, social status or whatever in life. But occasionally through the years you hear that horrible phrase, they're not our kind of people. And that's what we're talking about here. And if they're not, let's be clear, they're God's kind of people. I wasn't good enough, strong enough, amen, from the group. They're God's kind of people. Amen. No matter who they are, they're God's kind of people. Amen. And if they're God's kind of people, they need to be our kind of people. Amen. And a church needs to be open to everybody. Amen. Everybody, if it ain't so, it's bad, bad wrong with it. Jesus had the veil. When he died on the cross, the veil of the temple was torn in half. Why? To take away the barrier between God and man. Here's access to God. The one place you couldn't go. The one place you couldn't be. And the veil was torn. The Bible says from the top to the bottom. To make sure that everybody understood. Nobody on earth tore that veil. God himself tore that veil. And he made it clear that now the Holy of Holies is, is open for the people. Uh, the, the, the biggest barrier of all. And so I'm just going to say this and move on. If God is the one who crosses barriers, shouldn't his people be the kind of people who cross barriers? Amen. If God says, all right, we're going to reach them all, then that's who we need. If they're not, you know, if they're God's <laughs> kind of people, they need to be our kind of people no matter who they are. Now here's the big teaching of the text. Here's the big deal. Here's the big deal. If you only knew. <laughs> what a phrase. If you knew the gift of God, if you just knew what I have to offer, now I'm asking you for a drink of water. You know, if you knew what I had to offer, it would shock you. It would amaze you. Those of you who've received that, wouldn't you say amen to that? Amen. You know, what, if you just knew what I had to offer, if you just knew about this gift of grace, if you just knew that I'm ready to give you what you don't deserve, what you can't get on your own, what you, what you can't purchase or buy, what you can't afford, you know, you can't get it on your own. He gives it to us. Eternal life. How long does eternal life last? Forever. Forever, right? He says this, you know, this, if you only knew the gift, I've got life. I'm come that they might have life. And they might have it more abundantly. By the way, found in the Gospel of John. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Over and over and over again, He is this gift of life. If you just knew, if you just had any idea what kind of gift that I have for you. A hundred times in the Gospel of John, it talks about belief. Over and over and over again on every page nearly. And what you'll find in our text in John 4, it talks about it a lot. She believed in Him. She trusted in Him. And then she told the Samaritans who also, they all believed in Him for the gift of eternal life. 62 times out of that. I, I brought you those papers last week and didn't even mention them. They are not crazy. A hundred times the Bible says believe in the book of John. 62 of those times are read, which means what? Jesus. Jesus said them. And 24 of those times, listen to me now, there's equal sign between belief and life. Believe equals life. Believe 24 times. Don't take my word. Study it for yourself. Read the Gospel of John. The book that says these, this book's been written so that you will believe and that by believing you might have life in His name. This book is the book written that you might be saved. That's why I wanted to start off with the Gospel of John as we're you know, looking at a place to study enough. You know, this is the book that people need if they're lost. And this is the book that we need if we're going to be good soul winners. We need to get this message of life. You believe you have life by simply trusting and believing in Him for it. Now I know that a lot of people say belief is not enough, but they're wrong. Or even Jesus is wrong. Who are you going to go with? <laughs> Choose your company is all I can tell you. For God so loved the world, He gave His one and only Son, and whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but will have eternal life. Well, not only that, he said, if you just knew, if you only knew, if you only knew the gift that I have to offer, and then he said, if you only knew me. If you only knew the gift of God and who it is that says, if she knew who it was, she'd faint on the spot, wouldn't she? Yeah. 
you know, here she is. They, you know, they they were looking right for the Messiah, just like we're looking for him to come back again. Did you know that? They were looking for Messiah. And then there you have the religious leaders that totally missed him. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Verse 25. Who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. If you just knew. If you only knew. You know, isn't that how lost and dying world is? If they just knew this gift that he has to offer. If they just knew him. You know, what an amazing thing that would be. That leads me to the third phrase in our text. She had the woman then left her water park. Her water park. <laughs> Good. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, six flags over whatever. Yeah. The woman then left her water pot. The woman left her water pot. Can I tell you, she left more than that at the well. Amen. Woo, she left more than that at the well. Listen to this. She left empty desires and found satisfaction. She left empty desires and found satisfaction. By the way, I've been to Jacob's well and drank from it. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. They drop a rock over in it, and it takes several, several seconds for you to hear the splash. It is that deep. And then they draw water from it. You can imagine that. You know, we drink ice water. And don't you love ice water? Mm -hmm. I love to see how much ice I can fit in a red solo cup. Then yeah. I fill it back up with water. Then I get an extra cup of water to put them. I got duels on my recline. I got duels there, and I put them bowl cups there, man. I go work on that ice water. Can you imagine how cold water would have tasted to an ancient man? I mean, you know, they sit around drinking that old, you know, that old room temperature stuff and and when you pull that water up out of Jacob's well, it's just as cold as it can be. It's so good, so pure, so clean. We all got us a drink, and we loved it. Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. As good as it is, no matter how much water you drink out of Jacob's well, you're going to get thirsty again. You may feel like you are satisfied at this point, but one day again you will become thirsty. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. He will never thirst. I want you to know today, without a doubt, just a testimony, just one man talking to other people, I'm just telling you, you know, the things of this world are never, ever, ever going to completely satisfy your heart. You know, I think about this basketball game. I do. You know, I remember I prayed before this game, and when you pray about basketball, you know your heart's dumb. You know, that's just dumb. You know. Like, God ain't got nothing better to do than throw the basketball, you know. Y'all pray about winning rodeos? Okay, well, I never mind. You know, <laughs> you know and I was, you know, I was just like, Lord, I have been so wrapped up in this basketball my whole life. And I don't know if you're interested in basketball or not. Just, Lord, whatever you think, be fine with me. You know, what, just keep him safe. You know, boy, I love for, he was player of the game, hit four threes in the first quarter, just tore them suckers up. And uh, so they had to double team him, put a box of wood on him, and that's when the other twin went to work. That six foot nine boy took care of business. And uh, so it was so cool. They cut down the net. It was so great. It was so awesome. Everybody was, you know, taking pictures and having. Y'all know where I'm headed with this, don't you? Wow. Well, tomorrow night we're going to face the bus all day in Lafayette. And we might beat them. It might turn some wool cart wheels. But if we do, Friday, we got to face another. we got to go through another bus song. You know, and, and the thing is, is that there's only one way, or there's only one fella in the end that's remained standing. Everybody else got beat. You know, and that's just the way that it is. The things of this world, I'm not saying they're not worth pursuing. I'm just saying you, that better be, you better have more to live for than that. You better have more to live for than that. Education, <laughs> studies, money. How many unhappy rich people are there in the world? Oh, yeah. I swore he hoss. Yeah, that's a good cowboy long. I, I, I swore he hoss. I think they're unhappier than the poor folks. Don't y'all? Yeah. I mean, all you ever hear is about how they're jumping over bridges and, and, you know, taking dope. And, you know, they're, they're unhappy out there. It's like, no matter how much money they get, they got to ask more. You know, I, I read somewhere and I was listening to the news because I was watch, trying to watch for Austin. Uh, they interviewed him. And uh, he must have said stupid stuff because they didn't put it on the news. <laughs> I can't wait to see. Yeah, that's right. You get that honest, partner. 
Anyway, you know, I was just, you know, the whole thing is the things of this world that we pursue, the, you know, we think this is going to make me happy. You know, there are so many people, I can't stay here much longer, but there's so many people that think if I just had this, I'd be happy. You know, it starts out with a little kid. You know, if I just had this toy, I'd be so happy. If I just had a PlayStation, I'd be so happy. You know, if I just, I don't know what y'all need, a horse or something. If I just had this, I, if I just had a motorcycle, I'd be happy. You know, if I just had, well, I saw one. If I just had a house, well, I wish I had a house, I'd be happy. I'm going to tell you something, and this is true. I'm not telling you not to pursue any of that stuff. I'm telling you this. If you ain't happy with or without it, you ain't going to be happy with it. That's right. And we all know, we all know, y'all know that there have been times in your life when you have less than what you've got now. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. Yeah. There have been times in your life when you were so poor you couldn't pay attention. Am I right or wrong? Yeah. You couldn't afford the other they are and you were just poor. Yeah. And yet you could be happy in that. Am I right? This brother knows about it. Yeah, we could be happy in that, couldn't we? You know, and it's because there's something else that fills us up. And she found what it was. She left empty desires, chasing men, whatever she was involved with in life, and it wasn't good. And she found satisfaction when she chased the right man. And his name was Jesus, and she made him the Lord of her life, and her Lord and Savior, and her life was full. Listen to this. She left her religion and found a relationship. Don't even get me started on that. She left her religion right there. She was all concerned about, should we worship in Jerusalem? Should we worship in Samaria? And people always got dumb questions if they want to get into debates. Do you realize that? You know how many times I've been asked where did Cain get his wife? Where did Cain get his wife, they want to know? You know, how did, how did Noah fit all them animals on the ark? Now, you know, I got answers to those, but, and I just answered from the text, but the question I have back is what difference does that make if you don't know Jesus and you're bound for hell? You don't know the Lord and you're bound for hell. You're worried about where Cain got his wife? Come here, let me ninja chop you. I mean, you've lost your mind. Good grief of Moses. Wow. Religion focuses on works, bondage, doubt, and death. You say, man, you don't like religion. No, and Jesus didn't either. That's right. Let's just be clear about it. Religion focuses on works, bondage, doubt. They make up another rule or two for you to follow. That's what, that's what you'll get in religion. Let me tell you something. Religion is man's attempt to reach God. He wants to climb a mountain and get to God. And the whole problem is, is that God ain't up that mountain. God's already climbed down the mountain to come and get you. Right. He's ready to put you on His shoulder and pack you all the way to glory. You. Yeah, he wants to carry you. That's how that needs to be. She left her water pot. She left her religion. And then and she found a relationship. Uh, the last phrase that I want to share with you, the last phrase I want to share with you, is a phrase that we country people say a lot. Or I've said it a lot. You ever say, come see Come see. You know, that's, that's one of the best Easter messages you could ever find. In Matthew 28, it says, Come see the place where the Lord lay. Then it said, Go tell his disciples. So come see, go tell. That's a pretty good Easter message right there, isn't it? Yeah. And so come see, come see. Verse 29. Come see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? Come see. Could this be him? Could this be him? You know, come see a man. Oh, such, so, so much more than a man. You realize that? Come see he who, who, uh, who was the recipient of let us make man in our image. Father was talking to him. With him, everything was made, and without him, nothing was made that was made. You know that? By him, all things were created, and by and through him, all things consist. If it weren't for him, it all fall apart. Right. Catch that next breath for me. That came from him. Yeah. Reach down here and feel that right there. That one and that one, they all come from him. Right. Through him and by him, all things consist. Literally, he is the glue that holds this universe together. Yeah, come see. Come see a man. Who is the glue that holds it all together? Come see a man who walked the pages of the Old Testament. 
the ones who's going forth has been from everlasting to everlasting. Come see the one who is the fulfillment and who was Melchizedek. Come see the angel of the Lord who appeared to Moses in the burning bush, who also appeared to Moses on Mount Sinai and gave him the Ten Commandments. Come see! Come see this one who is the fourth man in the fire. Come see the one who performed all the miracles that you read about in the Gospel accounts. Come see the one who makes the blind to see, the lame to walk, the deaf to hear, the dead to rise up. You couldn't die around Jesus. In modern day vernacular, anytime somebody died around him, he said, Oh, no, you didn't. <laughs> Go from the grave they arose. Now go back and read. There ain't nobody ever died in front of Jesus. Woo! I love that, man. I just love that. Jesus is the opposition to death. Come see a man who speaks to the wind and the winds. Listen. Come see a man that when he talks to the devils, they beg for mercy. Yes. They beg. Oh, man, leave us alone. Leave us alone. Come see the one who even the wind listens to to his commands. Come see a man who taught with authority. You know what that means? He didn't have to quote nobody. You say, well, what do you mean he didn't have to? Did you notice that when I started to talk tonight, I did something? And I do something every time when I preach? And hopefully I stick with it some. You know, we read the Word of God. We're quoting somebody else because we got nothing to say on our own. And if somebody's got something to say, then oh, watch out for that sucker. We need to speak what you know, the, the, the authority comes from him. But he don't have to ask nobody. You know you're going to hear him preach every day for a thousand years. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. Think about it, okay? <laughs> you're going to hear Jesus preach every day for a thousand years, and I guarantee you it's going to be a rare thing for him to say, take your Bibles and turn to. <laughs> <laughs> You know, he can start off with, when I told Isaiah. <laughs> when I told Jeremiah. When old Micah didn't have nothing to say, I gave him something to say. Come see! Come see the one who teaches with, uh, with authority. I love it. It's one of my favorite places in the Bible. The crowd leaves because Jesus is explaining the Lord's Supper and they, they hear it as if it's the body and the flesh and the blood and they're grossed out and they don't know what to do with it and they think He's talking about camel. They don't even know what to think and they leave and they leave Him there with His disciples. And Jesus gathers up them boys around Him and He says this right here. You guys going to leave me too? And you know Peter who gets a lot of credit for saying stupid stuff and doing stupid stuff like cutting off ears and whatnot. He did a pretty cool thing right there. Remember what he said? Oh, Lord, where else could we go? You have the words of life. Oh, them two boys, come see, come see. The, them two boys that were on the road to Emmaus all depressed because Jesus died. Jesus was killed. He was put to death on a cross and he, he got up with them and I don't know if he had a hoodie on or what was going on but they didn't recognize him. He hid himself from them and he explained to them, listen, he explained to them all the scriptures pertaining to himself. Yes. When they got to the crossroads, he started moving on. I said, oh no, you've got to come to our house. We'll, we'll feed you. We want to hear some more. He got up there and he got to talking to them and answering their questions and talking to them about where he appeared, all them places in the Old Testament. And, you know, he continued to veil himself from them when they got there. He did, when they, he broke bread, they recognized who he was. I figured they saw the nail star prince when he nailed that, when he reached that. They might have saw the bread through the bread. Something strange happened because they knew who he was as soon as they saw him break bread. And then he left, and it was like one of them kind of times when he left, and it was like, ooh, woo. And he was just gone. He didn't use no door. He didn't climb out the window. He just gone. And them boys said it so good. Did not our hearts burn within us when he explained to us the scriptures? Come see the greatest preacher, the greatest teacher who's ever lived. Can I just tell you, he's so audacious as a preacher and a teacher, his nickname is the Word. Today we have the Word speaking to you. Isn't that amazing? amazing? I mean, that is absolutely 
Amazing. But not only that, come see. He also sports the nicknames Resurrection and Life, the Bread of Life, the Way, the Truth and the Life, the Archegon, the Boom Shakalaka of Life. Come see the man that for your salvation, he took the scourging at the cat of nine tails. He was beat beyond recognition. Come see the one who was mocked and made fun of as they put a crown of thorns upon his head, put a reed in his hand and slapped him around and spit on him. Come see the one whose hands were nailed to the cross and his feet to the cross. Come see the one who prayed for his enemies as they killed him on the cross. Come see the one who ascended into heaven and is coming again. Come see a man. Come see a man that told me everything I ever did. I want you to know tonight, you need to come see this Jesus. All she said was, come see. Come see. Man, you come check this guy out, you're going to get saved, and they all did. We're going to have a time of invitation. I, I hope these words make this text come alive for you tonight. We're going to have a time of invitation. If you're here tonight and you'd like to receive